very good day students so we are back with the second part of uh, the lecture on the neurogenic and the myogenic hearts so in the first part of this lecture we had discussed about uh, that what is a neurogenic heart and what is uh, the myogenic heart what is the difference between the impulse generation mechanism in both the types of the hearts uh, we had talked about uh, a particular heart of the limulus in the previous lecture and we had talked that uh, how the extra cardiac tissue which is making the nerve impulses uh, that is present around the heart and uh, that is a sort of extra uh, part of the heart which is controlling the contractions of that particular heart. And now uh, after the neurogenic hearts we discussed a particular myogenic heart of mammals then we are talked about the, uh, the pacemaking system which involved the SA node, the AB node, bundle of S, then the branches of S, then you have the Purkinje fibers over there and we had talked about that every part of the pacemaking system has got its own uh, pace, own you can say impulse generation mechanisms at different rates. So, uh, we had talked some part of uh, the ECG also, we talked about the ECG curve and how it is formed and then uh, we had started with the effect of the acetylcholine on both the myogenic and the neurogenic hearts. So uh, before uh, starting this particular lecture uh, as a second part of the previous one. So, I must start with the, the effect of the acetylcholine that we have taken in the previous lecture. So, students this was the particular slide that we ended up with in the very previous part of the lecture and this slide was explaining the effect of the acetylcholine on the uh, myogenic hearts and the neurogenic hearts. So, we had discussed that the ACH was accelerating the myogenic hearts and it was inhibiting the neurogenic hearts. So, we have also uh, discussed that uh, ACH is ineffective at very low concentrations and it can be excitatory on a very, very low concentration of 10 to minus 5. Uh, so, after the administration of the ACH over here, the heart was uh, excitated at this particular level and this is the example of the mitilus. And now students going beyond this particular discussion, the scientists they have seen that uh, this particular excitation of the myogenic heart of the mitilus that is absent if the sodium ions they are not present in the medium. So, this is a very, very important uh, line that I am saying. Uh, if I go further, this excitation is absent in the sodium free medium. <clears throat> so, this is a very, very important thing to note that ACH can excite a particular heart only in the presence of the sodium ions. So, there should be some threshold level of the sodium ions in the medium then only the small amounts of this much can be excitatory in the myogenic hearts of the mitilus. So, suppose if this sodium is not present in the medium, you add the ACH. So, there will be no excitation. And if you have the sodium in the medium and then you add the ACH, then only there will be an excitation like this. So, that means this particular graph is, is with the sodium ion levels. It is having the threshold sodium ion levels and thus the ACH is showing a positive or you can say acceleratory or excitatory kind of the action over here. Now, students after this now I am taking another example of again this is a bivalve 
this is a mollusk and this is the marcineria so this is an animal belonging to the mollusca phylum so here the heart is inhibited by a very small amounts of ACH so first of all I must give you an idea that uh, the bivalves or the marcineria it is having a myogenic heart and the myogenic hearts they are excited by the ACH but here the heart is inhibited by very small amounts of ACH even at the concentration of minus 12 moles it is inhibited so this is a very uh, you can say strange kind of behavior shown by the heart of the mercenaria now how is it going uh, if we go by the graph what is the mechanism that here you have the acetylcholine added so what happens that the resting potential it further decreases it decreases to some extent so uh, if we go by another example it is of aplesia so I'll be taking this particular graph later on now here the stimulation of the visceral nerve if it is stimulated it stimulates the depolarization of the junction potential so what is depolarization so it is a kind of uh, you can say ex excitation like this onto the upper side that will be depolarization and if you have a concept of a low curve like this it is a kind of hyperpolarization so if you have hyperpolarized kind of uh, neurons so that nervous tissue is not capable of making a heart beat that means that will be inhibitory if it is hyperpolarized and if it is depolarized onto the top level so then it can make a beat so here the stimulation of the visceral nerve it stimulates the depolarization of the junction potential then what happens so it is excitatory in nature so in the case of mercenaria you have the inhibition and in the case of aplesia you have a stimulation of the visceral nerve as excitatory now students here should uh, I should give you some uh, concept about this particular graph now just see this is the resting potential so this is the resting potential of the nerves of uh, you can say which are the main motor forces behind the contraction of the heart now if the acetylcholine is added over here with even this much of a amount it is inhibiting the heart now why is it inhibiting because it is making the nerve even more hyperpolarized so that I have told you earlier so if it is going beyond or below the resting potential up to this drop this drop is the hyperpolarization and suppose here is the threshold level this is the threshold level curve this is the resting potential curve or line you can say and this is the threshold level line so the nerve the stimulation should touch this threshold level to make a heart beat so if it goes like this and it touches the threshold level then it can make a beat and if it comes down like this and threshold is on the top level so it is coming just like this it is not touching the threshold level then it cannot make a beat even you have a small depolarization so what I want to say is that if the nerves are hyperpolarized making the beat is altogether very very difficult because if it is hyperpolarized like this now it has to travel from here to threshold level to make a beat and that is very very difficult 
So the distance from here up till the threshold level, this is quite big as compared to from resting to the threshold. So this distance is smaller than this distance. So that means if you have a nerve hyperpolarized, then there is a long distance to travel to attain the threshold level for making a beat of the heart. So this is kind of inhibition that has been seen in the case of mercenaria. Now after this students, we have the role of calcium ions in the ACH effect. Now we have seen that the effect of the ACH, it is under the control of the sodium ions as we have discussed in the previous uh, uh, part of the lecture. So if there is sodium free medium, the ACH won't give an excitatory effect in the case of the, uh, the bivalve. So, here we have the role of the calcium ions in uh, the ACH effect. Now just see what is the role of the calcium ions. Now suppose the medium is calcium free as we have taken a sodium free medium in that particular slide. Here we are taking a condition that uh, you have a medium which is lacking calcium. Now what is uh, the condition in this particular thing? If you are having a calcium free medium, then what is happening? We administer the ACH. Now, uh, uh, now you can take this particular graph. So what we have is that when we administer the ACH over here at this particular point, what happens that uh, there is no change at all. So what does it mean? So if you have a calcium free medium, you don't have any calcium ion in the medium, we administer ACH. So there is no change. So here you can see there is no change in the graph of the beat of the heart as there is no calcium in the medium. So that means that ACH effect it is dependent somewhat on the calcium ions also. Now, if I go further, now when the calcium ions they are administered along with the ACH for some time that what happens? Now just see students, now at this particular point what we added? We added calcium ions and then we added ACH. Now what happens? After that, this is hyperpolarization. That means this is inhibition kind of a thing. So ACH, now here it is inhibiting the myogenic hearts. So this is a kind of, you can say, uh, reverse kind of a thing, exceptional kind of a thing. So here, if you have uh, the ACH, effect on the myogenic heart, if you take this particular effect, it should have been a excitatory effect. But here, in this particular case, we are seeing that if we add calcium ions along with the ACH, we have a hyperpolarization curve. So this curve is for hyperpolarization, but you should make this curve somewhat down so that it should be below the level of the primary curve. So that should be the hyperpolarization. So this part of the curve is showing you the hyperpolarized, uh, you can say the nervous tissue. So if it is hyperpolarized, what will happen? It will inhibit the heart. It will do, it will not be making the heart beat. So this is the inhibition of the heart and uh, this is a kind of antagonistic effect. As we have already seen that ACH is excitatory for the myogenic hearts, but here it is an antagonistic effect as it is inhibiting the heart. And this is the example of the oyster. 
So you can give this particular example that the oyster is having a myogenic heart, but here uh, the ACH is showing an antagonistic effect by hyperpolarization of the heart and this effect of the ACH is calcium dependent. This is very, very important to note that in the absence of the calcium, this hyperpolarization will be absent. It will not be showing any kind of hyperpolarization if there is no calcium present in the medium. So, students, this is a very, very important example as this is an antagonistic effect of the ACH. So, there can be a small question for you uh, in the final examination that uh, how the ACH is affecting the myogenic hearts in the case of oyster or you may get a question that uh, how the ACH can uh, show some antagonistic effects or you can get a question that explain the antagonistic effects of ACH in case of oysters. So you must give this particular uh, graph and you must give this particular example of uh, ACH along with the calcium ions. Now students, we discuss the effect of first of all the ACH, then we discuss the effect of sodium ions on the ACH effect. Then we taken, uh, we have taken the calcium ion effect on the ACH effect. Now we are taking a particular salt which is called as the benzoquinonium salts. Now these benzoquinonium salts, they are also affecting the ACH activity. Now this particular graph, in this particular graph, I'll be showing you that how the BZQs or the benzoquinonium salt is affecting the ACH activity. So first of all, I must give you the concept that BZQ, it inhibits the effect of ACH. That means, suppose if ACH is uh, excitatory in a particular case at a particular concentration and if we add the BZQ or the benzoquinonium salt, it will nullify the effect of the ACH. So this is the most important thing to note. So the benzoquinonium salts, they are inhibiting the effect of the ACH on uh, the hearts of the particular animals. Now here, what we are taking is that if uh, we take this particular graph into account, just see this. So this graph can give you a particular idea about the effect of the ACH and benzoquinonium on a particular heart. Now here we have taken a particular uh, neurogenic kind of a heart. Now if I take this graph into account, now what is happening? That the heartbeat is going like this. So it is quite frequent and quite, uh, you can say, fast kind of uh, beat of the heart. And when we administer the ACH at this particular point, what happens? That after some time, the heart has become slow. It is slower now. But when we add the benzoquinonium salt in the medium, what will happen? the effect of the ACH, which is the slow, slowing of the heart, or you can say the uh, uh, inhibitory kind of effect, it is nullified and the heart becomes fast again as it was previously. So that means the addition of the benzoquinonium salts, it nullifies the effect of the ACH. So that was... Uh, the slide all about. So here you can uh, very well see this is the effect and you may give it in the examination. Now students, as the crustaceans they are known for their neurogenic hearts. Now I am just taking up this particular slide with some examples. Now in the case of crustaceans we have the neurogenic hearts. This is a very obvious kind of a thing that we are uh, discussing from the very start. Now, the nerve cells 
in the ganglia. They are present on the dorsal side of the heart. They are making the excitation wave. Now we had talked in the very first part of the lecture, in the previous lecture, that uh, we have uh, the ganglionic nerve cells which are excitatory and they are, uh, you can say, extra ki uh, cardiac kind of a tissue. And here also we have the nerve cells which are present in the ganglionic uh, uh, masses of the nerves and they are present on the dorsal side of the heart. They are present above the heart. They are not present inside the heart. Again, they are extra cardiac in the position. So they are making the excitation wave. Now students, these are called as the cardiac ganglia. So as the word ganglia, a ganglion is a group of neurons. It is a group of nerve cells. So if we uh, make, suppose uh, this is a ganglion, ganglion is a group of nerve cells. This is a ball-like structure in which you have many, many nerve cells. So many nerve cells, they are making a ganglion and here we have the cardiac ganglia. So number of the ganglia, it can change, it can vary in different animals according to the need that how many ganglia of, the, uh, 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 of uh, a particular animal, how many ganglia are needed to contract a particular heart of an animal. So it can be, the number can be small, it can be large also. So I think you have uh, taken the idea that what are cardiac ganglia. So these are the groups of the nerve cells. Now this particular chart is giving you the number of the cardiac ganglia in different animals. As we have discussed that the number of the ganglia can vary according to the size or according to the type of the heart. Now if we talk about first of all the legia, it has got six cardiac ganglia. If you talk about astacus, it has got 15, a huge number. If you talk about the Bacura group, <clears throat> it has got nine. If you talk about Homerus, it has got nine again. Five are large, four are small in size. So in these particular animals, you have a different number of the cardiac ganglia which are functional to contract the heart. Now students, there is something about the cardiac ganglia. Now, just see this particular diagram. This is a very, very important thing to uh, write and understand. Now, if you see this particular heart, this is a heart, basically. So where is the heart, first of all? <coughs> this is present over here. This is a tube-like heart. And uh, we have the cardiac ganglia present on the dorsal side of this heart. Now this is the case of the lobster. Now what we have here is that this is the first cardiac ganglion, the cell number one. This is the cell number two. That means this is the cardiac ganglion number two. So I have demarcated a star for a cardiac ganglion. So this is the first, this is the second cardiac ganglion. We have a third. Then this is the fourth cardiac ganglion. This is the fifth one. <coughs> and after the fifth one, we have four more which are present on the dorsal side of the heart. Now students, over here we have a total of nine cardiac ganglia which are present on the dorsal side in the case of the lobster. Now they are controlling actually the contraction of the heart. 
Now, in this particular uh, slide, I'll be talking something about the cardiac ganglionic impulses. Now, this is a very, very important uh, physiological part which is uh, related with the contraction of the neurogenic hearts. <coughs> now, students, in this particular diagram, I'm showing you the cardiac ganglionic impulses which are formed in these cardiac ganglia. So, as we have seen in the previous slide, we have got nine cardiac ganglia in the case of lobsters. It can be six, it can be uh, five plus four, it can be nine, it can be six also, it can be seven also, depending upon the type of the animal. Now, this is the case of uh, squilla. This is again a crustacean and the depolarization wave it comes at 20 millivolts and the wave frequency length is 500, uh, you can say milliseconds. So this is a very, very important thing to note that this phase is the 500 millisecond phase. So this is very, very small. And how it is becoming excitatory, if you see this particular wave, A, the topmost wave, how it goes, that it goes to a 20 millivolt depolarization, then it comes back, it goes again up, then again down, up, down, up and down, then it relaxes. Now this is a single wave of a single cardiac ganglionic impulse or a cardiac ganglion. So if you take uh, the third wave into account, <clears throat> so it is again excitatory and after this it uh, relaxes. So this is a kind of you can say as we have ECG graph or a PQRST curve in our case. So this is a kind of ganglionic impulse graph for the neurogenic hearts. And here the frequency wavelength is very, very small. It is 500 milliseconds only. So if you take the B graph into account, what is uh, this particular graph is all about? That uh, this is a beat. This is again a heartbeat, third heartbeat, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh and you have a difference of near to like five seconds. This is a five second difference in between the two beats and if you uh, hyperfine, if you zoom in into this particular curve, it is just like this. So this is a zoomed in curve which is shown in A uh, part of the diagram. <clears throat> so actually this curve is one curve of the B picture. So if you hyperfine it, if you, you can say zoom in into it, you may find various smaller curves in this particular graph. <clears throat> and the distance in between one graph and the second graph is of 5 seconds. That means you have a single graph like this, then you have a next graph after 5 minutes or oh, 5 seconds. So the distance of first and the second is of 5 seconds. So this is the kind of the graph in uh, the squilla. Now this is another example of limulus. Now here you can also see that uh, these are the graphs of the heartbeats and if you hyperfine it, you may have a, this kind of a beat. And here <coughs> you can again see that a single curve has got many smaller curves. That means uh, there is a kind of uh, re depolarization, a depolarization which is uh, reaching on the top many times 
in a single curve. So this is the type of the graph which is seen in the lumulus. And uh, students, here I am hyperfining one graph into hyperfine splitting graphs. So here you can see the zoomed in kind of a graph and what are the positions, what are the portions of this particular graph. So here I am taking a single heartbeat graph in the neurogenic hearts. Now I have taken two beats in this particular diagram. This is the first beat and this is the second beat. Now these beats they are hyperfined and you can see a different number of curves in this particular single graph. Now this is the example of the carcinus. Number one in these beats what are these stars? So star represent the initial fast depolarization wave. So if I hyperfine or I split these graphs, the very first part of the graph is the initial fast depolarization. And uh, this is the depolarization wave which is uh, very very important and it should reach the threshold level to make a heartbeat. So this is called as the initial fast depolarization wave. So this is the first part of the graph. Then students we have a lag kind of a period. So this period is uh, you can say a lag kind of period which is uh, called as the variable contraction phase. Now here what we have we have variable contractions. So first is the initial fast depolarization wave then we have many many variable contractions. So these contractions they are very equivalent to the tetanus condition of uh, the mammals. So in our case also sometimes we feel like our eye is uh, contracting at a very fast frequency uh, and uh, that is an involuntary kind of a thing. Sometimes a particular muscle is contracting simultaneously for some time. So that condition in the muscles is called as the tetanus condition. And here also we have a tetanus kind of condition in the case of the neurogenic hearts. Now if I take the example of the paleomon or the prone, what is present in this particular animal? We have got a graph like this. And there is some difference uh, with the, as compared to the previous graph. Now here what is A? A is the fast depolarization wave. So we have discussed it in the previous slide also. Uh, then we have three graphs or the three waves again. These are the B, C and D. So in the previous slide we have taken them as the variable contraction phase. So here also we have B, C and D as short depolarization waves. But students, one thing is very very clear in this particular uh, animal that the magnitude of the short depolarization waves, it is increasing. So if you see the B, it is at lower level than the D. So D is at higher levels than the B. And uh, this is a kind of a wave which is uh, going much closer to the threshold levels. The D wave is very close to the A level. And uh, this kind of uh, the short depolarization wave which is increasing in magnitude, it is seen in the paleomon. And this graph is in between the time and the, you can say the depolarization. So these are the short depolarization waves which are present in the paleomon. Then we have the E section. Now this E section, it refers to the repolarization wave. Now here what is happening that uh, the heart will be relaxing for some time 
and this time will be a gap of uh, 3 to 4 seconds depending upon the animal. As we have seen in the previous slides, this time can be 5 seconds in some animals. And uh, uh, this time, which is in between the two fast depolarization, it depends upon the type of the animal, it depends upon the environment, that how it is living and uh, how much contractions the heart of that animal needs to cope up with the oxygen deficiency conditions. So that was the case of the paleomol. Now students we have an example of Ligia. Now here we have uh, Ligia has got a neurogenic heart. So here the cardiac ganglia or the cardiac ganglion I should say it is a cluster of the neurons on the heart wall and they serve as the pacemaker so that we have taken earlier. So recently it has been found that not all the crustaceans they have the neurogenic heart. So this is a kind of a very rare kind of a thing or a sentence that all they do not have the neurogenic hearts. Now why? During the embryonic development of Ligia, the heart pacemaker mechanism changes from the myogenic to neurogenic. So that means uh, when the Ligia is in the development condition, in the embryonic state, the Ligia has got a myogenic kind of pacemaker system. But in the development, it has been changed to the neurogenic one. So that is the case of Ligia. Now, if I go further, uh, this is a photosensitiveness of the neurogenic heart of the isopod, which is Ligia exotica. So, students, uh, here, first of all, I should uh, give you a concept that uh, Ligia, in the adult Ligia, we had the neurogenic heart because it was changed from myogenic to neurogenic in the development. So in Ligia, now we are considering that it has got a neurogenic heart. Now what we have done experimentally that we administered 10 micromoles of TTX. This is a chemical which is changing the neurogenic heart to a myogenic heart for some time. So in Ligia, we had the neurogenic heart and what we did we administered TTX. So this neurogenic heart was changed to myogenic heart. <clears throat> so all the cardiac ganglia which are present over the heart, they were desensitized and the heart changed to the myogenic type for some time. So students, if you see this particular graph, see the first graph. So here, this is a control graph. Control means we have done nothing to this particular heart. So here what is happening that the Ligia is having a neurogenic heart. When it is in darkness, it is beating normally. When it is put to light, this is a light period. And what is when it is uh, put to light, it is inhibited. So that means it is inhibited in the light conditions. So this is the photosensitiveness. So what we are talking about, we are talking about the photosensitiveness of the neurogenic heart. So in the dark region, it is excitatory. In the light region, it is inhibitory. And again, when the darkness came back, it comes back, it is again becoming excitatory and it is becoming normal in the beat. So that is the control type of heart. If we put the TTX, so this heart is becoming myogenic. Now there is no role of the light in this particular heart. The photosensitiveness is gone. And now what we are doing is that uh, after this TTX application, these are the photoresponses. <clears throat> Yes, and now after some time we are washing the TTX out. So when the TTX is washed out, the heart has become normal back again 
to the neurogenicity and it is now sensitive to the darkness and the lightness when the light is coming it is becoming uh, inhibit inhibitory the light is inhibitory for that heart as it was in the normal condition and now this third graph is very equivalent to the normal position and when we administered the TTX it was uh, converted into myogenic heart and myogenic heart was not photosensitive in this particular case. So this graph is showing the effects of the tetrodotoxin which is the TTX on the heart response of Ligia exotica. So students with this we are uh, finishing with this particular topic. So I hope that you have gone through the concepts of the neurogenicity, the myogenicity and you may get a question on only and only the neurogenic hearts in your examination. So if you get this particular question on neurogenic hearts then you should talk about what is neurogenic heart, what is neurogenicity, what are the nerve cells, what are the cardiac ganglia, how are they positioned, how they are present, they are extra cardiac tissues and you should talk about the number of the cardiac ganglia in different animals, the position of the cardiac ganglia, you should give some examples of the heart with some diagrams and then you should uh, go for the effects of ACH the effects of sodium ions, then calcium ions, then the benzoquinonium salts on the ACH effect. Then you should go with the effect of the TTX on the neurogenic hearts of Ligia. Then the very important thing is the, uh, you can say the ganglionic nerve impulse graphs for uh, different animals. So you can add up into this particular uh, lecture from different books. So I hope that you can make up a good question out of this lecture. So thank you very much.